Hello, back again. Uh, this is the first, let's say, serious slot on, on process mining. You will see um, algorithms for this very first problem, which is process discovery. Let me introduce a bit the speaker. Uh, Sander Lehmanns uh, did his PhD on Eindhoven, 2017. And uh, let me just tell, tell you an, an, an anecdote of uh, Sander, which I always explain. I don't know if he knows that. So when I, uh, he's the inventor of one of the most common use techniques uh, for discovery well-structured process model, which is the inductive miner, which you will see today. So I was very upset when I was reading his paper because I was looking at the paper and I realized, oh, I, want, I, I, I wish I was the one who invented this, this paper because it's so nice. So without hesitation, let's welcome Sander and for, for his essay. Thank you, uh, Josep. Um, as, uh, as you can see, I had uh, one and a half hour more uh, preparation time than Josep, so I actually managed to put my own name on the first slide. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, in, uh, in uh, hope for a speedy recovery of Will, um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm glad to, to present his talk uh, on process discovery. Um, at the end of this session, please remind me, we do want to record some kind of wish uh, video with, with a shout out. Um, so if halfway you, uh, you, you think of a good idea, then keep it. And then at the end, we can, we can do a shout out and send it to him in the hospital. I think he would love that. All right, so process discovery. Um, uh, Josep ended with uh, this, or started and ended with this uh, overview, so let me also do that. Um, I'm not going to go through it because we are going to focus on process discovery. From an event log, we want to discover a process model. Um, we I'm going to show you three basic, um, three basic yeah, lines of thoughts or techniques. Um, first of all, the discovery of a uh, so-called directly follows graph that uh, Joseph also uh, already introduced. And then two kind of a little bit more advanced techniques, um, alpha algorithm and inductive minor. Um, everything I'm going to say you is in the book that you should have gotten in uh, your bag. And um, we are going to uh, keep it a bit formal. So I will show a few formulas, but um, yeah. Uh, I will also hopefully show it in practice in a live demo. Um, so if you uh, have some trouble installing Prom, I just made the pass group go through it because they wanted to use their own laptop for presenting. So what is the main idea of process discovery? From an event log, we want to discover a process model. And it's not so important for now which type of formalism or which type of model we want. Of course, I'm gonna give you some examples, but in principle, everything that brings you from a log to a model is process discovery. Now, oh yes, the first formal part. Um, an event log is a multi-set of uh, traces where a traces is a sequence of events. So um, we are going to see much more elaborate, well, definitions or more elaborate data that we need uh, or that we can use in process mining. But for this session, we're just gonna talk about sequences of yeah, let's say activities, that's a better term. Um, a process model um, is a, uh, for, for our purposes, is also a set of traces. So on a very high level, we're going from a multi-set of traces to a set of traces. And that, yeah, how, uh, how we can do that nicely, that is what we're going to see. Um, so, well then, of course, a process discovery algorithm then takes such an event log and produces a language or a process model. Um, let's uh, look at a little bit of an example. Um, here we have, on the top, we have an event log, uh, L1, and I'm gonna do a, a little bit of PowerPoint karaoke now. Um, we have 10 times the trace A, B, C, E. So, um, as in Joseph's talk, A, B, C, E can be about ordering pizza, it can be about handling a complaint in an airline process, it can, um, denote uh, a lot of things, but we're keeping it abstract, just A, B, C, uh, D, and E. Just, so we're just using letters. We don't care about the exact um, 
setting at this moment. So this event log has um, 16 traces of three variants. So the ABCE is a variant, and that means that this ABCE, this, this sequence, this trace happened 10 times in this log, and we've referred to that, this ABCE, as a variant. Um, so if we, um, uh, if we apply a process discovery technique to our event log, we get a process model, and that process model will express a language, which is a uh, which is a set of traces. So we lose the information how often it happens, um, but we gain a kind of a concise notation for a set of traces. So this, this thing we will see uh, later on a bit, uh, in a bit more detail what it means, that um, describes a language, a set of traces. That's our main thing, and that is seemingly simple, but well, we will see it's a bit more involved. Um, we're going to look at three techniques. Um, first of all, we're going to look at directly follows graphs techniques, or in basically what every commercial tool is using. Second, we're going to look at the bottom-up approach, the alpha algorithm, um, well known, um, basically the first process mining technique around, um, I think it's around 20 years old now, um, do not use that in practice. It's just for illustration purposes and to, to show that with, uh, with a good basis in mathematics and set notation, you can write an elegant uh, technique, but in, in practice it will often break down. Um, and the third one is uh, top-down discovery. We're going to look at inductive minor, and as Josep already uh, gave away the secret, I invented that. Um, so let's, let's dive in. A directly follows graph. Um, Yoohoo, more formulas. Um, so, but let's, let's just look at this example. So we, uh, in a directly follows graph, we have a start node and an end node, and you simply walk over the edges until you reach the end node, and every box that you encounter is a step in the process that you execute. Um, so given that this directly follows graph comes from an event log, we can also... Um, we can also derive how often each edge appears. So this, this edge, I hope you can read it in the back and otherwise sit in the front. We have 16 times that A was the first activity in a trace. Um, now, um, the language of a directly follows graph is then simply the set of all the traces that I just described. So anything walking from start to end is a trace, and then the set of all of that is your language. So if you have a directly follows graph, it's, an, it's already a process model, right? Because we said anything that takes an event log and produces uh, something that represents a set of traces is a process uh, discovery technique. So if we find a directly follows graph, technically speaking, we have already a process model. Um, so, um, how do we do that? Well, actually, um, we simply walk through the event log and for each trace, we keep track of, well, of course, we, s we start in the start node and then for every step we do in the, in the log, we take an according step in the model. So, um, from the start times, um, let, well, let's check here, we have, um, as the start event, we have A, 10 times. So. Here, from the start event, we add an edge to the A, 10 times. Then, from the A, 10 times, we saw a B. So, from the A, 10 times, we see a B. We do this for all traces, and um, the end of the trace is, uh, well, let's, let's do the first trace. Uh, in 10 times, we end with an E, so we do that here as well. We end with an E, and we do that for all traces, and then we have our directly follows graph. Um, how does that um, look? What does that look like in Prom? Um, Josep already showed you this this kind of uh, variant exploration. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna use that as a bit of a of a, of a log view. So here we have the whole log. There are a lot of traces, and this is again our pizza um, example. I hope you like Italian food, as Josep said. Um, one uh, plugin by Felix Mannard, who will also give a session on Thursday, I believe. Um, we have a that plugin produces a directly follows graph, and this is the result. 
Um, another technique um, is to directly follow Visual Miner by myself, which does the same. So it was a question, which plugins can you use? Well, this is one of them. Um, again, from green to red, you walk through the graph, and that is your model. Um, there can be a bit more uh, extensive uh, um, uh, visualizations based on this directly follows graph because it is a full process model. There's it's a set of traces. So we can do things like animation and um, uh, and uh, performance measures on it. So I'm actually going to show that live. Um, and I'm going to start from an event log. So if you have never seen PROM, this is PROM. I just took a log from my, uh, from, from my hard drive in and I uh, dragged it in. Um, and the only thing that's here on the on the left, we have a list of, of traces. So this is a, a, an event log of a, a loan application process from the BPI Challenge 2012. Um, if I click on one of these traces, then here in the middle I see the steps that were executed for that particular um, loan application. So this particular loan application with number 173703 had four steps. A submitted, A partly submitted, A pre-accepted, and A cancelled. This is our entire input. In process discovery, we want to do it fully automatically, so I'm not going to give the tool anything else than this. So, how does that work? Um, we wanted to show the directly... Oh, German keyboard, where's the Y? Um, so, one I'm going to show you is directly follows Visual Miner. And without any further input, it gives me this uh, directly follows graph of this model. And then um, also uh, animates uh, the, the tokens over it. So, uh, you see this in a lot of tools. And if you're talking with a, uh, with a manager or with, with some process stakeholder and you're doing a, a project, then you can talk about, yes, we have this, this, this nice uh, Petri net, so nice directly follows graph and, you know, edges and uh, boxes and arrows. But it truly starts to live if you... Where's the plus? <sighs> On. <laughs> ah, here. I was looking for the plus on my keyboard. <laughs> the demo effect, let's call it. <laughs> um, so every uh, yellow dot is one, in this case, loan application that flows through the process from green to red. Um, and this, this, is, this is typically very convincing, the, the, the little dots that, that flow through the process. Um, and, well, not to give too much away about enhancement, that, that will probably uh, come uh, in another uh, session uh, this week. But um, given that we have this event log with timestamps, we can replay the log on this model and then get all kinds of uh, extra information, like the sojourn time of, for instance, nine minutes for this, this activity. So this is an example of a, um, of a directly follows based tool. Um, and as I mentioned, most of the uh, academic tools also work in this way. They show you a directly follows graph. Um, so here we have an example from Will's favorite, Salonis. And um, well, you can, you can see it's kind of based on the same principle. You, so you start at the top and the, the start, um, the start yeah, thing looks a bit different. But in the end, it is the same thing. Um, it can animate and you can see times on it. So if you go to a typical process mining vendor, this is the kind of tool you get. Now, um, as um, th the most feared Italian food in process mining is called spaghetti. Nobody likes spaghetti. Um, because you can imagine that, that the nice process I showed you, um, well, it looked nice, yes, but you can imagine if that process gets a little bit more complicated, for instance, with yeah, 685 variant, 24 activities. Now, just imagine a graph with 24 steps in it, and then 
then comes the spaghetti rather than the lasagna. So what does that look like? This. Um, the, this is the, the data aware heuristics minor that we, that we saw before. Um, yeah, if you cannot read it from the back, I cannot read it from here either. Um, so if you, uh, the, the downside of directly follows graphs is that they tend to come up for complicated processes with spaghetti models, as we called it. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a bit of uh, uh, one, one size bigger, but yeah, you can still not see what is going on, really. Um, same for uh, the directly follows visual minor. Um, it looks a bit different. It still shows a directly follows graph. Um, and yeah, you would have to look at the coloring like to see the happy flow and so on. But uh, it, it's a bit tricky. Oh, yeah, wonderful. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, yeah, my main point, this is not something you can give to an analyst or a business owner and say, look, I, I discovered your process. Is, does this represent what you, what you do in real life? Yeah. Okay, so, first step towards um, process discovery domination. Let's filter this thing down. So we have this massive process and let's filter it down. Um, so, there are three... Um, type of, of, of filtering that I want to cover. Um, and the first one is activity-based filtering, where we filter the nodes. The nodes were the activities in the model, so let's filter that down. Then we, we simplify things a bit. Second option, variant-based filtering. So rather than looking at the graph, we look at the log and we throw things out there. And the last one, um, arc-based filtering. Um, and we'll already put a note there, not recommended, delete arcs in the DFG. So rather than removing the nodes, we're going to remove the edges. Um, so, well, we had our big, big spaghetti model, and we like a bit less spaghetti. So if we uh, filter on the top seven of the 24 activities, so let's say the activities that appear the most, the seven most appearing activities, we get this model. And this is already a bit more manageable in the uh, heuristic uh, uh, directly follows based tool. In Salonis, we get this. Nah. Okay. Um, then, so, this is simply throw away some activities and then you're done. Um, downside, of course, is that those activities, um, yeah, you don't you don't really see anymore. For variant-based filtering, you um, include not the most frequent activities, but the most frequent variants, so the kind of trace set in the in the model uh, in your log. Sorry. Um, so in Salonis, if you select that you only want to see the most appearing trace variant, you get one. Um, one trace through the model. If you uh, increase that to five, you get this. So by playing with that uh, variant parameter, you get more and more behavior in the model. Um, this is the top 10. And you see that, well, let's, let's go back. So one, five, 10. You, so you see the model getting bigger. And you know by the way you started that this is actually the most appearing trace in your uh, process. Um, yeah, and of course, if you uh, drive that to the whole log, then you end up with this nice spaghetti model. Um, now, why is it not a good idea to, uh, in the directly follows graph, just start throwing away edges? Next question for you. Who, uh, who would like to take a guess? Yeah. Yes, but in some sense that is also what we wa what we want. So we, we want to filter this model down. So somehow the edge cases have to go. So you were the second. Your second. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, that's in general a downside of directly follows graphs. But if you remove edges, then that problem kind of also diminishes. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so I cannot use the word sound here, 
but um, because sound is not defined for directly follows graphs. But um, if you start throwing away random edges, then it, you might end up with parts that you cannot reach or parts where you can end up in and never leave. So you need to do s at least something a bit smarter. And yes, there are commercial tools that actually do that, where you can find uh, processes that, that can never end or something. Um, so a few kind of wrap-up challenges for directly follows graphs. Um, well, the first one, is actually misclassified because this is a problem of, um, of discovery in general. A log only contains f finite traces, a finite number of finite traces. We don't study processes that run on forever. So in a, in a, in a log there is never any loop to be found. So an inherent problem and kind of what, what underlies kind of the, the, the all the challenges for process discovery is that you can never be sure that there was an actual loop in the process. Maybe it was just executed, maybe it can just be executed six times, maybe it can just be executed 100 times, but the loop you can never see in the log. Um, second, um, so um, we can assume that everything in the log actually happened. I mean, there are things like noise, but I mean, that's, that's a reasonable assumption, but we can never assume that we've seen everything. It's kind of th the same assumption as for the loops. So that something was not in your log does not mean that it cannot happen. Um, a, a, very, um, a, a very pessimistic view on this is that anything can happen, you just haven't seen it yet. That's a very uh, pessimistic view. Only a flower model would do. Um, so, other um, and what, what separates process discovery from um, uh, data mining is that in process discovery we do not have negative traces. So, in a typical event log, there is no record of this trace cannot happen. That, that's just not there. We just have examples of things that happened. So, the standard data mining um, kind of cons concepts of recall and uh, precision, they do not apply because we do not know if something cannot happen or not. Um, there are some, uh, some, uh, uh, some exceptions to this, so that there are some works, but getting these negative traces is always a bit tricky. Um, okay, so let's go a bit more abstract. This is the real process. And as you see, it's a dashed line because, of course, we don't know what it is. We just have this little sample, which is called an event log. Now, well, what we hope is that this sample of the event log lies within this uh, real process. Otherwise, we have behavior in the log that cannot happen in the process. Let's, yeah, let's, let's assume that we don't have noise here. Um, we want to find a model that approximates this dashed line as well as possible. But we don't have this dashed line, we don't have the real process, so we need to do with just the log and the model. Now, behavior that is kind of in the process and in the log is fitting behavior. That's good, that's what we want. We want to cover everything that is there. Um, and this part, behavior that is in the log but not in the process is unfitting behavior. And that's something we do not want, that, hi that harms fitness. Um, if we kind of look at, like, you know, okay, this, this log is a sample, and yes, it's all we have, but what we really want is to get to this dashed arc of the real process. That's what we want to find. So there we have uh, another three areas. So the overlapping part, of course, is all good. That means that the behavior was in the process and is in our model. Um, but this part is, um, is not good. So this part is the behavior of the real process that was not in our model, so we missed it somehow. This part, of course, is uh, um, even worse because that is part of the, uh, of the model, but it can never happen in real life. So we might be studying this process model and try to get insights, but in reality it doesn't happen at all. So um, this is a bit to, to classify and sketch where that we want to be with our model. So we're looking for a model that represents both the log and, but ideally this, um, the, 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 the dash circle, the, the actual process. Um, so um, in or given these uh, kind of all these areas, there have been, um, 
a few quality dimensions defined that uh, uh, we will see also in the session on conformance checking later this week, um, where fitness is the part of the behavior of the log that was also in the model. So this should ideally be one. Um, precision is the part of the model that was also seen in the log. So if the model contains much more behavior than the log, then we are again studying things that, can never, that might never happen in reality. Simplicity, we saw um, uh, the, the difference between spaghetti and lasagna models. We want lasagna models. We want nice, small, easy to understand models. Otherwise, we cannot even study them by hand. And finally, generalization. Um, generalization um, is a bit of, uh, well, I personally have a, a love-hate relationship. Uh, which most times uh, is uh, the hate part, but for the for the record, um, generalization is a um, is a measure of I have this behavior that I've seen now in the log. What happens if I look for another day or another year? So, kind of behavior from the future of the process will that still fit in my model? That is, the likelihood of that is generalization. Um, now. Why do I have a, a mostly hate relationship with generalization? Well, try to measure what that is. What that what it is is a number. So we want to estimate the behavior that will happen tomorrow. Yeah, good luck. Um, there are um, some uh, some other kind of yeah downsides to these to these dimensions and that is that they are not all easy to measure so I already mentioned generalization but precision has the same problem um, in precision is the part of the model as I mentioned that is also observed in the event log but what if that model has a loop then it has an infinite amount of behavior it's not bounded you can always add more traces so what part of infinite have I seen in a finite sample that's an inherent problem, and um, that makes uh, precision difficult to measure. So typically we, uh, we do that using uh, escaping edges, but I'm pretty sure you will hear more of that in conformance checking. A solution to all of this, and this, <laughs> this was not my note, we'll edit this. So, um, uh, If you add to this model uh, a notion of how likely it is that some behavior occurs, then all of these problems magically disappear. Because then, rather than, than having this infinite behavior of uh, a model with loops, suddenly every trace there has a probability. So you can easily say, I covered x percent of um, the model with the log. So then that becomes much easier. But yeah, that as a side note. Um, okay, that is how far I wanted to go for directly follows based um, uh, uh, process discovery. Let's now look at um, one of the, well, let's say, oldest, if not the oldest technique of process mining, namely the alpha algorithm. Oh, sorry, that is the next blue slide. <laughs> um, first, let's look at PetriNet, sorry for that. Um, in PetriNet, um, what you can see um, if you start a Petri net with the transition, so these are, uh, I hope you remember the, 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 the pizza baking steps, either authentic or completely out of Italy. Um, these, are, these are my transitions, these are my transitions of the model. If I write a Petri net like this, anything can happen. So there is no restriction on when uh, add mo mushrooms, add mush uh, am, can, can I say mozzarella? I think that's more authentic. Add mozzarella. Um, there's no restriction on that. Um, however, every place that I add to a Petri net is going to add, um, uh, is, is going to restrict the behavior. So for instance, if I add a place at the beginning with a token in it, then I show that um, BI um, can only happen once because I added a, uh, a place as an input to that BI, so now BI eats that token when it fires, and the next time there is no token anymore, cannot fire. So by adding a place, I restrict the behavior. Similarly, at the end, um, if my final marking, so I have to define when I'm done, if my final marking has one token in this place, then I can only um, execute CK once. That's my bottle. <laughs> no. 
So how about the place in the middle? Well, if the number of times I executed BI is equivalent to the number of ex times I executed CB, then I can add this place in the middle without changing anything. Right, so this place expresses that CB needs a token that comes from BI. So that, me that means that um, given that in the final marking this place must be empty, CB and BI must be executed the same number of times, and I can never fire CB before I've done the BI. That's what this place means. So by adding this place, I've restricted the behavior. Now we do that uh, on the other side two times. Then here, um, by adding this place, I express that a, a S and a M cannot be executed before C B. And furthermore, for each C B I can do only one of A S or A M. Finally, as this place must be empty at the uh, at the at the final marking, I've also expressed that the number of times that they, they are executed must be the same. So um yeah, it's written here. Number of times C B is number of times A S plus the number of times A M. Similarly here, but then of course in uh, in mirror perspective or in the uh, the other way around. Um, here, even though I am introducing concurrency, um, the basis of the place is still the same. So by adding a place, I say that AT must be executed after CB and so on and so on. So it doesn't matter that these places are concurrent or that AC and AT are concurrent. By adding them, I limit the behavior. Um, now, the nice thing about what I did um, up till, uh, in, in all these steps up till now in this, in this net was that each of them was an accepting Petri net. So for each of them, um, I can use it. It's a, it's a, it's a valid model. Um, and, well, I think Robin is going to talk about more about uh, these type of techniques. You are? Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> so this this is this is related to region theory, but we're also going to use it um, uh, for the alpha algorithm. And now it is coming. Um, no, it's not. Uh. <laughs> Damn, the first time in my career I can explain the alpha algorithm. <laughs> okay, so um, the the key point of accepting Petri nets is that we have an initial marking, so. It's a number of tokens somewhere in a place, and we have a final marking. So a um, again, um, uh, a number of tokens on certain places. And every trace brings the net from an initial into a final marking. That doesn't mean uh, transitions have to be connected. It doesn't mean that you always have to be able to reach the final marking. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's an accepting Petri net. Um, we can label the transitions. So, um, for instance, in this net, in this oh, sorry, in this accepting Petri net, um, these transitions are not labeled. That means that whenever they fire, we do not see a corresponding uh, activity. It simply means the net updates the marking, but we don't see any activity being performed. On the other hand, not all transitions need to have a different label. So, A here appears uh, two times. Um, and whenever we execute one of these transitions, that indicates that A happened in the process. Um, so the language, uh, we, we, we're going to look through these four. Um, and let's, let's do a live replay with, with big arm gestures. Um, so when we fire A, we get a token in P2 and P3. The token in P1 is removed. Then we have, uh, we have a choice. We either do B, we do D, or we do C. Let's say that we do B. Um, that consumes the token from P2 and produces one token in P4. So then the marking is P3, P4. Um, then there is uh, no choice because E cannot fire yet because it doesn't have a token in T5. Um, so then we can only do C, which consumes the token from P3 and puts it in P5. Now, that was one trace. That was uh, A, B, C, E. Um, of course, this B and this, this C are con concurrent, so they don't. there's no reason why they should fire with B first. So we can also swap that to A, C, B, E. Or in the beginning, we can do D. Um, 
without an animation, this is the closest I can get to explaining the firing rules of battery nets. But please read in your, in your handbook, there is a very nice explanation I saw. So if we um, swap the arcs of the D, so rather than the D going from in there and out there, we do it the other way around, in there and out there. So then suddenly we have a loop. Um, so we have to do B and C concurrent, um, and then we can end with an E or, well, if they are concurrent, so we can do them the other way around. <coughs> or we do a D, and then we are back um, in the state of P2 and P3. Now, this is a uh, battery net with a loop, and I challenge you to pronounce this trace ten times. <laughs> um, but you see that this behavior is uh, infinite. We can go on. There are an infinite number of traces in this set, but notice that every trace is still finite. Um, another example, so um, any, yeah, any person working in process discovery for more than a few months would get itchy from this model because, yeah, ugh. Um, but anyway, it's a v it's a it has a valid language. Um, you can uh, you can fire the A and then you are in the P2 P4. Um, then you have to fire B because C is not possible anymore. Then you go to P3, then D. So that is the first trace A B D. Can also be an A or concurrent, so you can swap that. Um, yeah, I think you get the ID, and I'm gonna skip this one. Um, now, why would you want to have an accepting battery net and not a directly follows graph? Um, a directly um, follows graph is, well, I mean, yes, you can transfer it to, to an accepting battery net, at least if it's sound. Um, if, you s if, you, um, if you have an accepting battery net, then there are a whole plethora of techniques that you can apply to it in order to study and to get analysis, to check the conformance, to do predictions, to do recommendations. I think we should organize a week where we can explain all these techniques for you. Um, one, one example are alignments. So um, alignments, uh, well, ag again, Joseph will, uh, will introduce, but uh, and, um, alignments are techniques it's a, it's a technique that takes an accepting battery net and a log and kind of tries to squeeze every trace of your log into the model. And then where it doesn't go, that will, that will introduce a deviation. And that in total gives you an idea of how good the quality of a model is. Um, we can translate accepting battery nets into BPMN or into, uh, into process trees or into um, EPCs. So, yeah, battery nets or accepting battery nets are a nice kind of intermediate language. So we can define them really, really nicely. They're formally well-defined. We have semantics, we have syntax. Um, everybody <laughs> in, in academia at least understands them. Um, so wha why do we restrict to accepting battery nets? Well, simply because that is the tool that we can do all kinds of fancy stuff with. Now my clicker gave up. Aha! The alpha algorithm. I think it's, it's back. Uh, thank you, Tobias. Um, this is the alpha algorithm. <laughs> Have uh, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, it's, uh, it's actually surprisingly elegant and simple. Um, when I was a bachelor student and first uh, getting a, uh, uh, my, my first lecture from Will, he explained this, this alpha algorithm and he always puts this eight lines of uh, set theory and mathematics on the slide and says, see, this is really easy. Um, and actually, when you understand it, it is. There's basically nothing to it. Um, so... Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to introduce these lines uh, pr properly in, in the next slides. But um, So just, just to note that this is uh, a slight um, kind of yeah, um, further evaluation of the original algorithm. It's, it's a little bit better. But again, again the pre-warning, do not try to use this in practice. It's, it's nice for, uh, for studying purposes, but yeah, it doesn't filter, it doesn't, uh, doesn't produce sound models, and so on and so on. But let's have a look. Um, 
let's uh, start um, with our directly follows graphs. So um, we we saw in the very beginning of, of this of this this lecture how we can find from an event log such a directly follows graph, and we also saw that we can actually already study this graph. So yeah, but let's let's move on from that because. Um, um, we also saw the downside, so let's let's uh, apply the alpha algorithm to this. Um, and for that, we only need, um, well, basically two relations. We need a so-called um, directly, yeah, directly follows relation here. The the little arrow with the L on the top in green. Um, so if we write a one to a two. That means that in the directly follows graph, there is an edge from a one to a two, but not the other way around. If there is no edge altogether between a1 and a2, we write this little uh, sharp uh, thing. So a1 sharp a2. Um, we do include the start and end, which is a, a little bit artificial, and this wasn't in the original alpha algorithm. But if we do that, we will get some nice properties, we will, which we will see at the end. So in the end, what do we use for the alpha algorithm? We use this adapted set of activities, which is all activities plus our start and end, and we use the directly and the not connected relation. Um, so, first step. Um, what we do is we look for uh, sets of activities, so subsets of this, this uh, A prime, such that all activities within the set are not connected in the directly follows graph, so we're in this hash relation. <coughs> and between the set, there must be a connection from each activity in A1 to each activity in A2. Now, if you want to write this down as a as a pseudocode in, in, in algorithm, yeah, that is annoying, right? So you need to traverse and you need to do kind of yeah, a combinatorial uh, iterators. Um, and don't we all love that in papers, right? So rather than writing that, we just say that we want such a set, and that is here on the top. So, um, yeah, that's basically it. That's the alpha algorithm. <laughs> um, so we're looking for all of these sets. Or are we? We're not looking for all of these sets, because um, if um, you, you can kind of kind of think if we have such a set then we can just remove the C and then we end up with also with two sets that validate that. So yeah all of these um and according to Will there are twenty, I believe him. Um if we have this then actually these are also all valid uh sets that we want. So we want a smallest set. And so what we want is we cannot remove any activity or we cannot add any activity and then still be in valid territory. So we want kind of the maximal sets of this. And that is actually um, all there is because if you, uh, if you think about how we constructed our uh, accepting Petri nets, and that is why it became here before, um, every such relation is in fact a place because what this says by um, by uh, means of this uh, of this uh, uh, right error relation, after every activity in here, say C, we have one activity of you know, of here, and between them, they cannot uh, they cannot follow each other, so they are mutually exclusive. So that means after every one from A1, we have exactly one of A2, and this is exactly the thing we saw before. That is a place. So we add that, and then. Yeah, the rest is just bookkeeping. So Petri nets are defined as a, as a seven tuple of, uh, sorry, a six tuple of this, this, and this, and this, like places transitions. That's it. All these, tr all these um, sets we convert into a uh, into a Petri net. Um, yeah. So for our example, let's uh, let's do a uh, let's <laughs> let's do a small example. Um, let's look at, at this one, CDE. 
What, what, we, what we should have then is that there is an edge from C to E. Let's check the directly follows graph. Yes, there is. There should be an edge from D to E. Yes, that is correct. And there should be no edge between C and D. And that's also correct. So this is one of the sets we, uh, we target. It's a maximal set because we cannot add anything. If we add a B to this set, well, B has an edge to E, but B also has an edge to C, so that is not valid. That's not a valid set. So we cannot extend this anymore. This is um, th this is the set of maximal sets we're looking at. So that is that will be our places. Um, we transform that into a Petri net, then we, we remove the labels, and then we are back to the battery net we started with from the log. Um, now, a change with respect to the initial uh, alpha algorithm are these start and ends. So here, they kind of, you know, that, that's this, this, this two silent transitions, they kind of look out of place, they don't add anything. But yeah, imagine um, this one, in this net, we really need this start because, uh, yeah, there is no other transition to put here. So a slight adjustment, and then um, it's again a little bit more elegant and formal. Um, so some um, properties, or basically say uh, advantages of the alpha algorithm, are that it is scalable. So finding these, sca these sets is, of course, exponential, but that's it. It's exponential in the number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, transitions that you have. But for the rest, we just go through the DFG and find those sets. That's it. Um, there is some, uh, some guarantee called rediscoverability that um, s tells you that um, if you take an event log that is of a certain class, free, free choice workflow nets, you get a log that, rep that is um, big enough or has enough information from that system, and then you discover the alpha algorithm, then the model you get is language equivalent to the process you started with. So it has, it's not just doing something, there's also some guarantee that you can actually find the process back that you started with. Um, some downsides is that it cannot handle short loops because then these uh, these these sharp and the directly follows relation go crazy. They they they're not there, um, and of course it doesn't introduce silent transitions except for at the start and the end. So there is no skipping that can be discovered by the alpha algorithm. Um, so yeah, this is uh, a, a warning. As as Will wrote it, I, I said it a bit stronger. Um, this is a very nice example of how. Um, event logs, Petri nets, and process discovery, process mining kind of come together. It's really elegant. Um, didn't it was actually just two lines of of, uh, of 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 set theory, and that's it. So it it really it's a nice illustration, but in practice, of course, yeah, th this this can go wrong in a, in a in an awful lot of ways. Um, so. For instance, one thing that can go wrong is that you, that you have these uh, unconnected um, parts in your model. Um, and we saw before that such, an, uh, such a transition in a Petri net means that this C is any uh, executable at any times, which also means that this process never ends. So this is an unsound model. Um, um, probably uh, alignments would choke on it, but I hope you uh, find that out in a later talk. Um, in PROM, there is a, uh, a plugin for the alpha algorithm, um, and that then would give you such a model and a Petri net that you can use for further analysis. Okay, so a, in the alpha algorithm, we started kind of at the bottom. We said like, okay, we have these two transitions, can we put a place in between? That's bottom up. Now we're going to go from top down. So we're gonna start at the top, and then look, what is the most prominent behavior in my event log? Split it up, and then uh, recurse. Then we have a smaller problem. And that is called, of course, as all computer science know, is divide and conquer. So we make the problem just a little bit smaller, and then we do it again with a smaller problem. Um, this is, uh, so what's coming now is the inductive binary technique. Um, and um, 
this has been uh, implemented in Prom and in Salonis. And well, as Will said it, I can, uh, as Will wrote it, I can say it. It's the leading process mining discovery technique up till now, and um, it's it's about 10 years old. Um, people are still coming up with better versions of it that still use this recursive recursive structure. So for the basic. We're gonna discover uh, process trees because, yeah, petri nets are are nice, but and they work well in a bottom-up fashion. But kind of top-down, then we would need abstract things and, and stuff. Let Let's stick with process trees. Um, this is a process tree. Um, the top node tells us that the branch on the left should be done before the branch on the right. Um, then we, in the middle, we have a uh, so-called XOR, which uh, says that one branch should be executed or the other one. Not both, not overlapping, just either of them. The third one is the concurrency. That means that the branch on the left should be executed at the same time as the branch on the right. Um, so, there is one more, um, uh, and that is the loop. We will, we will see that in a minute. Um, but um, I hope that you see that even though I'm saying this is something else than, than an accepting Petri net, it is basically translatable into a Petri net without issue. So when I'm talking about a process tree, if you really want, you can also think about uh, uh, an accepting Petri net in the back of your head. Um, another example. So here, um, again, the, the, the root node is a sequence. Then uh, we've well, so this, this says you first have to do an A, and then you can do a loop. And that means the loop, um, the uh, left branch, you have to do any way. And after that, you have a choice. You can either stop or do the right note and then the first note again. And then you are in the same space that you got with. So we refer to this as the loop body. This should always be executed. Well, on the right side, um, is the redo. So you do redo it, the body again, and then you have a choice to, to uh, stop or uh, continue. Um, for uh, in, in this model, we see actually the same. Um, so we see that we can, uh, after we've done B and C concurrently, we have a choice. Do we exit using an E, or do we do the D, and then we're back in the first place where we first do uh, a B, C again. Um, Again, if you are a bit dazzled by now, <laughs> have a look in the book um, where there are uh, definitions uh, around. So one other uh, example, uh, one more type of note that I want to introduce. Um, here we uh, have the activities B and, uh, B and A. Um, those are kind of the standard transitions in the process tree. And here is a so-called silent uh, step. So that is the silent transition. And rather than a, a black box, we, uh, we denote it with tau for some reason. OK, this is the formalism that we're going to find, that's, that are process trees. Now let's see how we can do that, how we can uh, find uh, a, a process tree from an event log. So we're going to, um, first of all, decompose the log in several parts. So we're going to look for the most important behavior, and that will be our node. So we're going to look for sequence, exclusive choice, parallel, or loop. Once we found it, we split the log into sub-logs, and then we recurse. Um, so let's start with this very um, red event log. Um, this is again our uh, ordering pizza uh, pizza log. So we're gonna uh, gonna order a lot of pizzas today. Um, so first, how do we find which behavior is the most important one in the l in the log? Well, we make a directly follows graph, and that in this case is shown here. Then, um, in this case, we have a sequence cut. And how do we how do we know that? Well, we can draw these 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 vertical lines, and we see that every directly follows edge always goes from left to right. So every edge just crosses um, to the right. That means that this is a sequence cut. We we can record that choice. Um, so we uh, divide the activities into six subsets. 
Now we need to split the log. So we have found the most important behavior in the log, that's the sequence, and now we need to split it up. Um, and based on this coloring, you ca can already see what we have to do. So we have colored in the log uh, according to these colors in, the, in, the, in our cut. And that then looks like this. So we split up every trace according to these colors, according to the sequence cut. And then we end up with, well, six um, smaller logs. Um, some of these are, have become trivial. So for the green, the yellow, and the red one, we see that there is only one activity involved. Also the, the purple one, by the way. There, the recursion ends. That's a base case. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so what we record in the end, what we end up with after this first recursive step is a sequence node and, well, six, are they back? Yep, six, um, six sublogs. Now we can recurse. These, two, these four only have one activity, it's a base case, so we can replace that um, by, a, uh, by a single activity, namely CK, BO, CB, and BI. This one, the blue one, light blue one, is a bit more involved because we see that not every trace has it. So some traces skipped um, the eating pizza. For some reason, some people ordered, had their pizza made, and then did not eat it. They still had to clean the kitchen, by the way, at the end. But so for, um, for uh, this blue part, we have uh, a choice between eating the pizza or skipping it using a tau transition. For um, the purple log, this is a base case, CK, BO is a base case, and so on and so on. Okay, now let's recurse on the one remaining log that we have, that is the blue one. We make a directly follows graph, we simply start over. We make a directly follows graph, and then we identify the most fitting cut, um, the most fitting uh, uh, top behavior that we can find. Anyone has an idea which one here? Which type of behavior? Is it a is it a sequence? Well, no, it's not a sequence. Um, yeah. Well, for for XOR, what we need is that we, for an XOR, we need two parts of the model, or uh, two parts of the directly follows graph that have no connections between them. For a C, so, well, yeah, th that's not the case here, right? Even if I remove uh, the, the start and the end, because we, we don't consider them, um, we still don't, th this is still one connected piece, so we c there's, no, there's no XOR cut here. There's no sequence cut either, because um, the we cannot draw an edge that, that where, uh, where all the directly follows edges only cross in one way. But this is a concurrent cut. So this is the cut we can make here. And how do we see that this is a, co this is a concurrent cut? Um, that is because every, every edge that can cross this, these two lines is there. So every activity on, on in, in this part of the cut has a connection to and from every um, uh, activity in any other part of the cut. So this is a sequence cut. Um, again, we color according to this cut, so we have uh, three sets of, uh, of activities. Um, we color that in the log and then we have a slightly different uh, log splitting function, so rather than uh, Right, right now, it's not a straight line through it, right? It's not a sequence, but it goes just goes, yeah, the red is everywhere. We simply spread it out. We just um, project it based on these colors. Then we end up with this. Um, the red and the blue are, again, uh, standard base cases. They only appear once in every trace, so they become uh, single activities. And this one, um, the green one, um, we see that, yeah, it, it happens 
um, at least once in every case, but sometimes more. So how do we, can we model that in, a, in the last recursion using a uh, loop where we have to do AC at least once, and then we, can, uh, we have a choice. We either stop or we do a tau and an AC again. So this construct, this, this loop uh, construct, expresses that we have to do AC at least once, but uh, we may execute it as many times as we want. Um, oh, the red one was two activities, my apologies. Um, we, uh, here in the red one, we have a clear uh, sequence cut, so we recurse on, uh, on this red log. We create our directly follows graph, and here we see an XOR cut, because there are no edges between AS and AM here. Then we again split the log. We uh, end up with our final process model. This is um, the inductive minor algorithm, and I uh, want to show that in, uh, in real life as well. Um, so remember that we were in this, uh, in this minor for the directly follows graph a while ago. Um, we can also use the inductive minor on that. So the tool looks the same, but it isn't. So some differences between the directly follows um, uh, minor and the inductive minor, or basically BPM models, are these little split points um, that tell you that the process splits in two. And no, no, I need to enable disable the animation, otherwise you cannot see them. And these little um, uh, split and join points for concurrency. So here we have found concurrency stating that um, A registered, A approved, and A activated must be executed um, the same number of times in any order. Um, now, one of the reasons why you would go for something so more complicated than the alpha algorithm is that um, in a directly follows graph, you don't have any concurrency. And that's why you get all of these spaghetti models, because yeah, basically um, in concurrency, anything or the in the concurrent branches, if you look at these um, if you look at these top three activities, they can happen in any order. So there is no, um, in, in a directly follows graph, you would see edges between all three of them. Well, basically, it's uh, they they cannot happen in any any looping sequence or anything. So a directly follows graph would be much more complex compared to here, where you s simply say, yeah, they are concurrent. Um, so back to our process tree. As I already mentioned, a process tree can be uh, translated into an accepting Petri net without any issue. Um, so when I uh, when I say um, process tree, you can think of this net, which is actually what we started with. Um, you can also visualize it as BPMN, and well, my experience in, in practice, um, process trees are very hard to grasp for industry, uh, for, for our industry partners, um, and it, it's, it's simply very abstract. Um, Petri nets are a little bit better, but yeah, still there is this, this, there is this concurrency and there is this, this choice and token, so that that's still a little bit kind of hard to grasp. Well, BPMN, even though it uses more symbols um, like you know the plus and, there are, and the, we have the inclusive or and a few more, um, in my experience, um, this is much better understood simply because it has more symbols, which is kind of counterintuitive. Okay, so um, in the book there is a formal definition of all of the cuts that I've uh, that I've shown to you, and um, yeah, if uh, I, I'm the author of this, so if you have any any further questions, then uh, then please don't hesitate to to ask. Um, let's look at another example um, for uh, this log uh, that we used um, uh, before. Um, the um, heuristics minor directly follows uh, plugin will show you this graph. Um, the alpha algorithm will show you this 
battery net and um, the inductive visual miner, which actually uses uh, uh, process trees under the table but shows them um, using uh, kind of half BPM notation, will show them like this. Some other visualizations, if you really want, you can actually see the process tree and then that looks like this in PROM. Um, or um, in any of these cases. So you can actually translate it to a BPMN using one of the plugins in PROM. Um, we can map it, as I mentioned, to an accepting battery net. So that was one of the questions in Joseph's talk. So yes, you can translate such a directly follows model to a uh, accepting battery net in PROM, no problem. How about Salonis? Um, well, and here you, s you also see the, the point I was, I was making uh, a little bit earlier around directly follows models and accepting battery nets. This is a directly follows mo uh, model. And you see that this is, if I just swap between them, um, once you understand how battery nets work, they are much simpler. Because try to get from this picture the same information as this model. That's very tricky. So hereby a pledge <laughs> for everyone move beyond directly follows models. Yes, they are nice and they are intuitive, um, but they are also quite, yeah, bloated, quite spaghetti prone. <laughs> yeah, well, for this simple model, um, the alpha algorithm even would do better with the PetriNet. Okay, um, so the inductive miner also works on larger event logs. So given that we're using process trees, there is no chance that the model you return, that your model you get, will uh, will be unsound. So there is no risk of, of having any issues. But it might take uh, a bit of work in order to get from this nice spaghetti model to a lasagna model. And also Solonis uh, actually uses inductive miner. So let's uh, think of that. So to summarize, um, in inductive miner, the models are sound. The process tree can be translated to an accepting battery net without any issue. They are sound. Um, the basic algorithm that I shows you guarantees that every behavior in the log will also be in the model. So whenever you apply inductive minor, there is no fitness less than one to be gained. Every model you will discover will be able to replay the log. Now this is a curse and a blessing. It's a blessing because, you know, at initial thought you might say, okay, I have an event log, I want to see the behavior in that event log. But, yeah, the, the downside is that it might have to, to overfit a bit. So whenever it cannot find one of the cuts I showed you, it will, oh, it will increase the behavior and then give you a model. So there is no single um, discovery technique that's going to be perfect, I'm afraid, and that's why it's still an, an, active, uh, an active research field. Um, it has, in general, good performance because it is uh, uh, cubic in the number of, uh, of activities, so it's actually faster than the alpha algorithm, um, and it also provides uh, several of the uh, guarantees that I mentioned before. So given a, uh, that your process is in the shape of a process tree, and your log is uh, big enough, so has enough information, then the inductive miner will find the model that is language equivalent to the process you started with. That's a theoretical guarantee. Um, so, what I've shown you in this, uh, in, in this session, um, there are techniques that are um, um, that are process discovery techniques that discover directly follows based uh, models. It is not um, uh, not the ultimate discovery technique. In fact, there is no ultimate discovery technique. Um, directly follows models have a few downsides: complexity, spaghetti models, and inherent um, inherent limitations for concurrency and loops. Um, I've showed you two. Um, kind of ways of attacking process discovery. One is bottom-up, one is top-down. 
Um, for the bottom-up approach, we started with the transitions and using the alpha algorithm, we added places whenever possible in order to arrive at the model. So that is bottom-up. We start from the transitions and add things locally. On the other hand, we have the top-down discovery, where we start with the entire log, we see what is the most important behavior in this log, we split up every trace in the log, and then we end up with several smaller logs and we can do the same in a divide and conquer way. Um, this is not a solved problem. As I mentioned, there are um, every year there are new discovery techniques that do um, discovery slightly better on some of the logs. So yes, you can you can find a log and if you throw it into Prom or you throw it into Salonis or you throw it into Disco, you will get a rubbish model. Yes, that is still the case. And that's what, what I think makes this field interesting. Um, then a... Uh, um, a, f a few final remarks. Um, we have a few uh, online courses, or uh, Will's, uh, Will has a few online courses on Coursera, um, Process Mining Data Science in Action. This, ha this course has been followed already 150,000 times, um, and it does require quite a bit of time investment. Um, and there is another course uh, coming up for um, theory to execution from uh, Will in his uh, uh, area of Salonis. Um, then, as, I'm, as I am giving this talk, um, I uh, allow myself the liberty to add a, a bit of uh, shameless self-promotion. Um, I started here in RWTH two months ago as a professor and I'm still hiring a PhD. So if you feel that you might, uh, might like to work on, on, uh, on something, then uh, please feel free to scan this, this QR code or just Google it. All right, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, Liam is. Thank you. Uh, so I was wondering, well, first, uh, thanks for the overview um, for about these miners. Um, I am wondering right now, and then, yeah, it's for understanding what, uh, I think it was in the context of alpha minor, you mentioned transitions and arcs, and I can, um, I think I know what a transition is, but I'm wondering what is an arc? Um, an arc in a Petri net is, uh, is the, the, the little edge between a place and a transition, or between a transition and a place. Okay, thank you. In a directly follows graph, it's simply the, the edge between two activities. And a transition would be in a directly follow graph also between uh, the edge between the activities, right? Yes. Okay, yeah. thanks. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I already have the uh, next one. Uh, yeah, thanks also from my side. Um, I have two questions about the inductive minor. Yeah. So the first one is, uh, in the prom demo that you showed, I think I also saw a filtration slider. Yeah. And I'm wondering, where does the filtration happen in the inductive mining algorithm? Is that with the directly follows graphs, or is that later? So you mentioned, do you mean the, that slider of the path? Uh, yes, precisely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so that works on the directly follows graph. Um, but but in, in each recursion, when you make a directly follows graph, it will, uh, it will throw out some edges. Okay, and then I'm just wondering, because we uh, like discussed slide, like for a few minutes the disadvantages of filtering paths uh, in a directly follows graph, does that still apply or is that then uh, um, still abolished? Um, well... Mm, yes and no. So yes, you throw out edges, and then um, the uh, then the directly follows graph might not be yeah let's let's say sound uh, by by mean by lack of a better term. Um, however, um, what the inductive miner will do is then try to find a cut and split the log. So the combination of that cut finding and the log splitting um, still makes that. 
uh, that the model doesn't get uh, unsound. So you don't have that problem here, no. It's just okay. um, kind of an internal fiddling in order to, to still find a cut. And that cut, that cut might not be perfect for that log because you filtered something, but then you're gonna, sp you're gonna split the log. And in that splitting of the log is guaranteed that you still, um, you, you still uh, recurse well. Of course, you drop the fitness, uh, the, 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 uh, you drop the fitness guarantee at that point, yeah. Okay, yeah, I understood, thanks. And then the second question, um, I think in the earlier presentation, the one before yours, there um, was also some conformance checking with the inductive miner. Yeah. And I'm wondering, is there a quick way to explain that? Otherwise, I'm also... Yeah, sure. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so then um, I need to find a model with a log move. There is a particular setting that has that. Um, so you, you, see, you see what the paths filter does. The more I drag it down, the more um, ah. uh, deviations occur. So this little red arc here that kind of bypasses a transition. Sorry, uh, just a quick interruption. Yeah. So which are we checking now the event log and the discovered model, or is that? Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. This is uh, this is. Um, so in the visual miner, it does it does everything for you. So it discovers a model, mm -hmm. that's kind of the the structure, and then it uh, replays the event log on that model, and then shows you the deviations of these two. Is that bad data mining practice? Absolutely. Um, so if you want to to validate, uh, you wouldn't use mix your training and your test log. But yeah, on the other hand, we don't have anything better. <laughs> so yeah. But um, to, to, to get back to the question, um, this little red arc uh, means that you are skipping A finalized. So the model says here at this point you have to do A finalized, but the log said no. So the log skipped it. So the log went straight through. So in 98 cases, here the model said do A finalized, you have to do A finalized, but it didn't happen. This is the opposite. This is uh, in 2,245 cases. Here the model said you just have to do nothing, you have to continue. But in the log there were 2,254 2, extra steps that were executed. And we can even see which ones. They were all A pre-accepted. So by, by dragging down the pass filter, um, I've kind of made the model simpler and easy to look at. Um, but um, kind of the cost for that is, of course, that yeah, some behavior falls out. It's not there anymore. So an, I think a big weakness of the current commercial tools is that they barely support checking this model. Because this, this is the full model. There are no deviations anymore. But if I filter it down, then um, if, I don't know, if I don't look at these deviations, then, yeah, what's... What's the value of this model? Because, yeah, you know, like um, 5,000 times a finalize was executed, but 8,000 times the model said you have to do it, but it was skipped. Imagine that you are analyzing and basing business decisions or massive investments based on that a finalized is mandatory. Well, in, in reality, it's, it's more skipped than executed. So there, yeah, I think that doesn't fit the storyline of, <laughs> of that Will had for this talk, but I think conformance checking is something very important to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, you said with a little bit of work, yeah. I can make this work for larger event logs. Uh, can you um, elaborate a little bit on that? So, um, the examples that I use today, so even though this is a real life log and the, the creator of that log just came in. <laughs> um, so, um, this, this is a very, a very nice small log that, that works well in the tools. And in general, like structured processes or uh, let's say small processes work well in, in, in tools. But if, you, if the real process is such a spaghetti model, or in, in kind of a pessimistic terms, anything can happen, and we see any behavior in the log, then of course it becomes much harder 
to uh, to drill down into something manageable uh, that that you can study as a human analyst. So what we mean, what I mean with uh, there is a bit of work to be done is um, if you if you are um, in such a, if you have such a log that comes from a from a very complex process, you have to yeah do something in order to, to dump it down enough that you can actually study it. And sometimes the techniques can do it, so you can just, you know, uh, s s put the slider down a bit, but then still you need to understand what is what the tool is actually doing behind the scenes in order to not yeah, mess draw conclusions that are not valid, um, actually. Um, other things you can do is say, um, okay, this is a very complex process, but I'm interested in this particular deviation. So I'm going to filter the log to only this deviation and then see and kind of dive in. So it's a bit of uh, yeah, filtering and then, then continuing. So th yeah, th the world of process discovery as I presented it, um, um, it it's, it's a very nice mathematical and, and elegant field of, of giving, having a log and finding a model. But yeah, in real life, uh, of course, there's, there's much more work involved. There's, there's no magic box where you put an event log in and you get insights out. So it's, it's a bit more work involved. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, like uh, when, when you do the cut in the model, uh, there was a role of silent transitions. Uh, when uh, the, uh, the tra uh, transitions compliance with the, uh, they have connection with the previous one, uh, if there is some uh, information is missing, then you are adding the silent transition. And when the first uh, occurrence were more than the uh, connections or uh, that was uh, uh, like AC was, uh, uh, I, I want to see that sl uh, slide when there was a cut and um, yeah, like, uh, like that, yeah. Um. AC and uh, silent transition, and uh, then uh, a EP and, and silent this transition. One. Yes, this one, this one. So uh, my question is, when there was more ACs, you add silent transition, and there are less EPs, then you add silent transition. Can you please elaborate this a little bit? Sure. Um, so for, for this case, for the green one, um, we observe that every trace has exactly one BO, is, is this the green one. So there we don't need to do anything special, that's a base case. Um, because how can we represent um, a model that has one time, one particular transition in every trace, is simply that's, that's the transition. For this one we need to do something more. So here, um, we see that some traces, there was no EP. So it was either one or zero. Um, to represent that, we can use an XOR between that activity and the silent transition in order to skip it. There is a need to add a silent transition. Uh, my question is yeah. that. When uh -huh. there are missing, there, there is a silent transition. When there are more than the traces, then there is a silent transition like, uh, 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 like the first one, the first occurrence have uh, the silent transition and this one also. So um, I'm, I'm wondering why we need to add a silent transition here because it does not compliance or it is missing or there is something that we don't know that's why we are adding si silent transition or there uh, if there are some entries which are more than uh, the first occurrence then we are adding a silent transition so um, uh, uh, are they defined or they have defined meaning or uh, like so um, that, that's, that's a very good fundamental question um, and the practical answer for this setting of inductive minor is that we need it in order to get a fitting model. So the, the, the root node that we've discovered before tells us that we have to do each of these five, uh, sorry, six uh, sub trees. Um, we have to do something there. So, and we, we split the log, and then we end up with this log. So, what this tells us is that at this point in the tree, we should, um, we should do something 
that gives us either an empty trace or a uh, or this this EP, this this light blue uh, light blue transition. So that's why we the, uh, the inductive finder has to introduce a silent transition. Um, and that what does it mean? Well, if I um, if I if I have to explain it to end users, I said here the model says that it has to be skipped. But the real, the real thing is actually, yes, we just need it in order to get a fitting model. So is there a practical meaning? Like, does it mean that it was skipped? Um, well, if the model is, is, is truly, if you take it literally, yes. But technically, we just needed it to get the model fitting. That's, uh okay, oh yeah. We uh, we uh, still wanted to, uh, to, uh, to have a, a shout out for Will. So I think we uh, we need to to put the camera here. Has anyone thought of something we can say as a as a as a group? Oh, oh. I get interrupted. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh. And then just ju just just come to me afterwards. Then uh, I will happy to answer. Okay. So who has thought of a particular thing we can shout out for Will?